Well, uh, good evening, everybody out there in internet land. My name is Dr. Ben Bellarado. I'm the laboratory director here at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And I'm really excited to be the moderator for this evening's uh, presentation uh, entitled Holes in Our Moccasins, Holes in Our Stories, the Apache Origins and the Promontory Caves um, with Dr. John Ives who goes by Jack, I've just realized, or just found out. And um, before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the webinar series. Yeah. So um, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, or Navajo, and the Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Our mission related work would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, present and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. And Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections and sacred lands. At Crow Canyon, our mission is to empower the future, or sorry, excuse me, to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through, through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And you can learn more about our organization by tuning into our website at crowcanyon.org. Here you can see uh, on this picture in this slide, our beautiful campus located in southwestern Colorado, just outside of Cortez, uh, and just in front of, just north of the beautiful Sleeping Ute Mountain, you can see in the background there. And once our campus reopens, we definitely invite folks to come out and, and check out what we're doing. Uh, but in the meantime, you can look at our website and see all the different types of educational experiences uh, that we offer, the archaeological research we conduct, and uh, the Native American initiatives that we're involved with. So please check us out. Now, before we get started, I know over the last couple of years, uh, a lot of people around the world have become very intimately familiar with uh, Zoom conferencing, uh, video conferencing program Zoom. And um, but in case you haven't had the opportunity to work with Zoom, I'll give you a couple tips on how to improve or enhance your viewing experience. So first of all, you can move the talking heads. So at least on my screen, uh, when I open up Zoom, I have these little boxes where you can see, say myself. Uh, uh, Dr. Ives and Taylor Hasbrook, our, our web, webinar guru, and you can uh, move those around. You can take your cursor, basically grab those, change the configuration of those boxes, move them around in case they're blocking some part of the slides. Um, so you can see the, the full uh, presentation. Uh, you can also ask questions. We encourage you to ask questions. Now, Dr. Ives isn't gonna take questions at the end of his presentation, um, but you can, basically put your question into this Q&A uh, box here. So somewhere on your screen, you should see this chat, raise hand, Q&A, live transcript. And if you push the Q&A, you can type your question in there. And throughout the presentation, Taylor and I will be compiling like questions um, and trying to sort those out. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, and then if you're having difficulties viewing the, the presentation at all, you can actually move over to our live stream on Facebook, which is crowcanyon.org slash Facebook. And there's like a one or two second delay, but it's pretty much up to the second. And you can also type questions in there and we'll do our best to try to uh, pull those into the, into the discussion. Uh, you can also tune into our YouTube channel, crowcanyon.org slash YouTube, where you can uh, view this presentation after the fact or any of our other presentations that have, we've done in the past are all uploaded on there for, uh, for folks like yourself to go check out. And so I know after this presentation, you're probably gonna wanna tune back in and, and, and watch it again to see all the parts you might've uh, overlooked. So we uh, in, in invite you to do that. And then also if you could like and subscribe us um, to our YouTube channel, uh, that'll help us unlock additional functions so we can enhance your viewing experience even more.
Um, this presentation is part of our larger webinar series. And so uh, in the future, in the next couple of weeks, we have some other great presentations. So next week we have Ancestral Pueblo Fishing Strategies with my friend and colleague, Dr. Jonathan Dombrowski. It's gonna be Thursday, July 7th at 4 p.m. And then the following week, we have Cultural Astronomy, excuse me, Cultural Astronomy of the Ancestral Puebloan. Uh, Chaco, Hovenweep, Mesa Verde, and Wupaki with Brian Bates, and that's on Thursday, July 21st, also at 4 p.m., so check those out, and then we'll have uh, additional presentations in the future. So then turning back to uh, our presentation for this evening, uh, like I said, uh, the presentation is entitled Holes in Our Moccasins, Holes in Our Stories, Apache and Origins, and the Promontory Caves with Dr. John Ives. And before we get started, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Ives. So Jack Ives received his BA uh, with high honors from the University of Saskatchewan in 1974, his MA from the University of Alberta in 1977, and his PhD from the University of Michigan in 1985, all in anthropology. From 2007 to present, he's been a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Alberta. And from 2012 to 2017, he was the Landrex Distinguished Professor. Ives is also the founding executive director of the Institute of Prairie Archaeology from 2008 to 2019, which is now the Institute for Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology, where he remains a research associate. From 1979 to 2007, Ives served as the <clears throat> excuse me, archaeological survey, or served with the Archaeological Survey of Alberta, the Royal Alberta Museum, and the Historic Resources Management Branch, with senior, senior management responsibilities as Alberta's provincial archaeologist for over 21 years, uh, where he is the recipient of three premier's awards. He's an adjunct professor at Simon Fraser University and the University of Saskatchewan. And Ives is the recipient of the University of Michigan's Distinguished Dissertation Awards, which was subsequently published as a theory of Northern Athabascan prehistory. Now, presently with Joel Janetsky, a well-known archeologist uh, from, uh, from Utah, uh, he is the co-editor of the forthcoming Holes in Our Moccasins, Holes in Our Stories, University of Utah Press publication, which is an edited volume on Apache origins. So um, without further ado, I'd like to turn uh, the mic and the, the PowerPoint over to Dr. Ives. And thank you so much for coming this evening. And we really appreciate you giving a presentation uh, for us. And we look forward to what you have to say. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you for that lovely introduction, Ben. Just let me share my screen here. How's that? Now, if I appear to look away, it's not that I'm just looking away from you. I've got another screen here. Maybe I'll put this over here. And like Ben, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that I'll be talking about a variety of traditional lands, uh, Treaty 6, 7, and 8 people in Canada, in Western Canada, uh, and traditional lands of people in the Great Basin and the American Southwest. Today, I'm actually on Vancouver Island, and I'm very near uh, First Nations Reserve, the Slonavis people, one of the Coast Salish people uh, surrounding the Salish Sea between Vancouver Island and the British Columbia mainland. I also would like to say what a pleasure it is to be able to talk to you. I know some doing some of this research that we're very far away in Canada, so it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to people um, uh, through the Crow Canyon Institute. Before you keep going, John, when you moved your PowerPoint, um, it did get pulled off of your screen there. All right, we got it back. Does that work okay? All right. And I can see it again now, thank you. All right, so holes in our moccasins, holes in our stories. This name, and we're looking from Promontory Cave 1 out over Great Salt Lake, actually came from work that I did with uh, a linguist colleague, uh, now retired Emerita Professor Sally Rice uh, at the University of Alberta, and a friend and colleague uh, in the Dene community, Sutena community near Calgary, Bruce Starlight. There has, over the years, been tremendous interest in exploring the unity of the Dene language in Western North America. And Bruce and Sally were instrumental in organizing a series of gatherings. This is one in 2019, where some spontaneous drumming and dancing has broken out just before lunch, where people from as far away as Arizona and the Northwest Territories gathered uh, to talk and think about Dene cultural and language 
identities. We've had a number of instances where Bruce, for example, has visited us while we're working um, at, at Promontory. Uh, moccasin making workshops, which are designed to facilitate the use of, of language. Uh, gatherings with a, a variety of people, one in 2017. On the left, the far left-hand corner, the, the famous and really distinguished Dene artist, Alex Janvier. Um, my colleague, Sally, actually mortgaged, remortgaged her house to purchase one of, the, of, of his paintings. He's uh, such a, a famous artist. Um, and uh, working closely with members of the community, community, we'll talk quite a bit about moccasins in the course of the evening. And of course, the real experts at moccasin making are people like Sally, on the left and our friend, the late Terry Remy Sawyer, uh, 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 an excellent sewer and a tremendous uh, storyteller. Uh, the idea behind the whole title for one of these sessions was that archeology, span linguistics can contribute to an understanding of this tremendous expansion of Dene speakers across Western North America, but certainly not the entire story. And so too, of course, can oral traditions and so much other uh, cultural information. So we were looking for, for ways in which these things could flow together and create a yet larger picture of what is, in my view, one of the most extraordinary events and processes in all of the history of the Americas, this expansion of the Dene language family. So the particular thing uh, that I've become interested in is how did Dene speakers, Dene language, how did it move from a Northern homeland where, as you can see in this larger diagram, there's the greatest diversity of Dene languages and the other languages in North America, Aeak and Tlingit, that are more distantly related to the Dene languages. How did this movement to the South actually occur? I am not a Popperian scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but I really did like what Karl Popper had to say in this statement, that if we're interested in understanding a particular problem, we need to take a cross or transdisciplinary interest in it. It can't be solved from a single perspective. And so to explore how, for instance, a person like Geronimo could, in the distant past, have this Canadian heritage, uh, I began working with an earth scientist, uh, Professor uh, Fraze, a Canada, uh, leading Canadian scholar in the earth sciences who helped us so much with dating of the promontory deposits early on. We've done a lot of work with uh, Dr. Beth Shapiro's genomics lab at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And of course, working with people like Terry uh, to try to gain a better understanding of the intricate sewing and so on that we see with these moccasins. I maybe uh, can preempt a possible question. Ben and I were talking about it. I'm not a Southwesternist by any means. I have worked more in the subarctic and the, the Great Plains region. But I did have a stint in the Southwest. Uh, wisely, my um, uh, supervisor committee at the University of Michigan uh, when I was about to leave, I hadn't completed my dissertation, but I was about to take up a job at the Archaeological Survey of Alberta. They said, we know you have some Canadian experience, but we think it would be a good idea if you got some other kinds of experience, uh, archaeologically speaking. And the choice was between uh, working at Monville in Alabama. And I had done a bit of research with Chris Peebles on that, but I thought, boy, that might be hot and humid. I might like the dry southwestern heat a bit better. And the University of uh, Michigan had a bit of a connection. Um, to Southern Illinois University and their master project at Black Mesa, which you can see in the background here from Canyon to Shea. And so I did have a six week stint of working there and that really wet, whetted my interest in this. Um, it involved working closely with, in many cases, Navajo, some Apache crew members. And there was a fellow named Wilson, a Western Apache fellow. We had long talks at lunch, that kind of thing. And at one point Wilson said to me, he'd, he'd been at an event, I think in California, a powwow or something like that. And he'd met someone from Northern Canada. And he, while he couldn't really understand them, he could more or less understand what that person was saying in their language. And he found this fascinating as did I, how, how could that be? When he had no knowledge of who this person could or might be. And of course it did allow me, the, the, the folks at, at Black Mesa were really good at taking us around and showing us various Puebloan as well as, of course, traditional Navajo things. So that, that really uh, lingered in my mind uh, as I went forward. Now, as Ben said, I did become involved in more senior management for much of my government career. And you don't really do projects. I had strong interests in Dene kinship, which I uh, 
explored at the time, but these were things that you might do off the corner of your desk. And I did follow what literature there was uh, for people who were interested in exploring this north to south transit. I was a bit um, concerned that a lot of the reasoning applied in some of that research was quite circular. Individual artifacts like microblades or microblade cores were sometimes said to be involved in DNA or Athabascan prehistory, uh, such that if you found microblade technology, uh, then it would indicate the presence of DNA or Athabascan ancestors. The difficulty with these types of things, whether they're large or small, and some Northern Plains archeological uh, phases such as Basant or Avonlea were also said to be perhaps the material culture signification of a, of a DNA presence, is that circularity of the reasoning. Uh, and the difficulty with that, say for instance, with regard to microblade technology is that while DNA ancestors certainly made microblades, other language family members also made microblades. And there are instances in the Canadian North, for example, where we're certain that Dene ancestors were involved, but they weren't making microblades at that time. So in a certain sense, how would you tell a false positive from a false negative? And to me, the way to break out of that circular reasoning is to make sure that you're considering a variety of lines of evidence, whether it's kinship or language, or especially genetics. So I saw a great value and looking towards independent lines of evidence and trying to create a search image that was informed by those independent lines of evidence. Where there's real dissonance in those lines of evidence, to me, that's a sure sign that we're not understanding something about whatever we're investigating in the past. And where those lines of evidence begin to converge, well, that should mean that we're beginning to grasp at least the broad outlines of what we're looking at. So to do our research with, with my colleague, Joel Zineski, and many others involved in this, Dave Rohde and a whole variety of people, um, we really wanted to focus on conducting uh, or constructing a search image. And migration is part of the context here. So what would prompt people to leave a Northwestern North American homeland was a significant question. Now in the background here, this is an image of Mount St. Helens. And as destructive as that eruption was, uh, several decades ago. It is a mere hiccup to the one that I'll mention here now. I, I'd like to refer to the White River Ash eruptions, of which there were two. One, uh, about 1700 years ago, the North Lobe, so that means White River Ash North, the W-A-R-N, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner, where the ash blew down the Alaska-Yukon border. There was a second, more massive eruption um, that we now know occurred in the winter of AD 852, 853. And that's because that eruption registers in the Greenland ice cap where years can actually be counted. Now there's a great deal that can be said about this. The North Lobe eruption was massive. It involved 15 cubic kilometers, not cubic meters, cubic kilometers of ejecta. The East Lobe eruption nearly 50 cubic kilometers of ejecta thrown into the Northern Hemisphere. Much of that would be volcanic ash. And of course, that's um, comprised of microscopic or small shards of natural glass, something that's really terrible for terrestri terrestrial and aquatic um, ecosystems. Uh, there's a summit crater area believed to be near Mount Churchill, Mount Bona, at the Alaska-Yukon border where six kilometers of that area is gone. To volcanologists, this would be a colossal Linnaean event, an explosive event with a eruptive column height. In this case, they would estimate to have been more than 40 kilometers in height. So even if you were upwind of this terrifying event, you would have been aware of it because of that eruptive column height. I did ask a specialist at our university once, how destructive would that be? And this is the estimate that he came up with. 30 to 40 thermal nuclear devices going off. So this was a profoundly destructive event that left ash, as you can see, scattered all the way to Great uh, Slave Lake uh, in that east lobe, the W-A-R-E lobe of the eruption where it's visible, but it's detectable cryptically, geochemically in Greenland and as far away actually as Ireland and Northern Germany. So it was a massive event. Now, one of my PhD students, Todd Christensen, has worked extensively on the ecological and cultural impacts this was likely to have. 
There's a great deal that could be said about that, but perhaps we can best summarize it by saying that in the Alaska Yukon region, both Pacific salmon resources and caribou resources are very important to the ways of life that Dene ancestors lived there. And you can see here, hopefully you can see my cursor, the high impact zone up to five centimeters. So um, uh, that much ash, uh, which we would consider to have a severe impact on both terrestrial and aquatic uh, uh, ecosystems. You can see that that falls right across these salmon bearing streams, either coming from Alaska or British Columbia, that would be important to life ways for Dene ancestors there. And you can see that also falls across the winter habitat of barren ground caribou who are moving seasonally back and forth uh, up into the higher latitude settings where they calve and feed and then come back into the boreal forest and alpine forest for the winter, where caribou are quite unique in that their digestive system, their, their gut flora, uh, can actually make use of lichens that no other animal can make use of. So it's very important habitat for them. So we think that a disruptive event occurred that may have been the spur to people heading farther south. Now, in terms of migration, there's something that pushes, but what would the poles be? I also did work quite a bit on the Northern Plains. And in my estimation, I think the Plains region of North America was a great big cultural vortex. In the past, and certainly in the historic past, the Plains was constantly drawing people in. I think that was because the communal bison hunting lifestyle could be very productive, fruitful for people. There was a dramatic ceremonial life. Many of the people that we would construe as archetypal plains people, for instance, the Sioux or the Cheyenne, actually had comparatively relative uh, recent histories um, in that case in the, in the Eastern woodlands. So in terms of something that would draw people away from this catastrophic volcanic eruption, I think that plains lifestyle uh, would have been important. And of course, that did happen for plains Apache people. And it did happen for my friend and colleague, Bruce Starlight's people with Sutena, who became thorough plains going people, uh, strongly allied with Blackfoot or Blackfeet, Blackfeet people on the Northern Plains. Part of shaping that search image for me was really influenced by this brilliant small article by Edward Sapir, the anthropologist and linguist, uh, who was so gifted at explaining these things. And he wrote a little article I really highly recommend reading this, where this master can just teach you something in a brief period of time, about four words in the Navajo language that he felt revealed a Northern origin for that language. I'll just focus on a couple of them. One in the lower right-hand corner is the word for corn or maize, and it has two parts to it, a da part which reflects food, and a prefix, na, or in some languages, ina or ana, which has the meaning of alien or enemy food. And here you can see the power of historical linguistics in that regard. How much archeology span would you have to do to get the idea that maybe when Apachean ancestors encountered maize or corn, there were some ambiguous circumstances around that. The other one I'd focus on is in the upper left-hand corner up here, where we can see um, a couple of instances of spoons and in the American Southwest, spoons are made from the husk of a gourd. But what Sapir was able to show was that the underlying meaning of that word is actually horn, because in Northwestern North America, mountain sheep or doll sheep horn is actually the substance from which the spoon will be made. This is one of the spoons that Captain Cook collected from Tlingit people uh, in his 1778 voyage up towards uh, Alaska. So we'll come back to that. At the end of the article, Sapir laid out a roadmap with great vision, I think, for how this might have taken place. He used a bit different language of his day, but today we would say that at one time, Dene ancestors lived in the boreal forests of the subarctic where they foraged, they hunted and fished um, uh, for a living. They subsequently moved into the Northern Plains world, the pedestrian plains bison hunting world, after that, they had opportunities along the plains peripheries, both to the east and the west, to interact with other societies as they moved farther south. And then eventually, Apogean ancestors entered the southern plains and the southwestern region, where they would create new homes for themselves, some of these ancestors. 
for my colleague Sally Rice and I, this stimulated an interest in a certain linguistic dimension of it. If you leave the Canadian subarctic, the boreal forest, you will begin encountering things you have never seen before, and you'll need names for them. You'll have to create names, neologisms, uh, linguists call them. And some of these things could be quite important. Rattlesnakes, scorpions. You wouldn't want to be saying, be careful of the whatchamacallit. Um, uh, you would need to name these things for very practical reasons. And we began to see quite a clear pattern emerge. We were just talking about maize, and here you can see among Southern Apachean speakers that everyone had the idea, the underlying idea, that maize or corn was enemy or alien food. In the North, you see something different happening where people much later in the fur trade first encountered corn or maize. In one, in one instance, maize then is named big flower berry. And in another instance, you can see there, maize is horse's tooth that the incisor uh, of a horse resembles a corn kernel to a degree. The overall pattern without going through all of them is that you can see in the Apachean world that people shared an idea for how to create a neologism, how to make uh, a word to refer to these things. Here's another example here. In the North, there is a word for thorn, particularly for the wild rose. In the Apachean world, the thorn is abstracted to mean the entire cactus. So this suggested to us, linguistically speaking, that the speech community for the founding Apachean population must have been relatively small and cohesive so that people could share these ideas in terms of naming. There couldn't have been big geographic barriers like the Rocky Mountains, for example, in between different branches where you begin to expect different naming practices to take place as we see for some of the examples in the North. Then of course, beginning in the 1990s, there got to be a great deal of genetic evidence coming to light. And it became evident from genetic studies of mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome uh, DNA, that there were specific genetic signatures associated with Denny ancestors in the North. For example, varieties of A haplogroup are almost fixed in Northern populations, almost everyone is some variety of mitochondrial DNA uh, haplogroup A, and in particular, some of these variants. These variants then, in terms of the, ge the genetic estimate of timing, um, some of which appear in the North, A2A4 and A2A5, they appear in the American Southwest, probably about a thousand years ago, the geneticists uh, calculated. In every case that the geneticists spoke of, I noticed they felt that there was a small population founder effect. The initial population was relatively small is the conclusion that they reached. But by the time these populations moved farther south, there must have been really significant gene flow between those populations and neighboring populations. Haplogroups B and C don't actually occur in these northern populations. And so the inference there the geneticists reached was that many people were joining the apogean ancestors proceeding to the south. And especially women were doing so because the mitochondrial DNA, DNA evidence was quite compelling. And of course, that is inherited from our mothers, not from our fathers. And one other thing you'll we'll notice that the timing of this was about a thousand years ago, if you look at this graph here, or even at this more detailed uh, um, diagram created by Pavel Rodontov and associated uh, linguist and geneticist researchers. So there's a lot of information in this diagram, I know. Here are the promontory caves midway in between northern and southern Apachean populations. One reason for thinking this had occurred about a thousand years ago, it is now known that the Inuit expansion across the north, known as the Thule uh, expansion, took place also in the 13th century. And there were certainly interactions between northern Athabascan or Dene and Inuit populations, not very friendly ones often, but nevertheless, some. Um, genetic sharing occurred there. That sharing is absent in the southern um, or Apachean population suggesting that they had already left the north. So complex diagram, but I think I'll leave that for now. So there's lots of information being summarized there, but that leads to a search image. It's difficult to find something if you don't know what you're looking for.
And the conclusions that we reached would be that we, we should at the outset at least be looking for a small and fairly cohesive founding population. Not something as big as a great big archaeological phase like Avonlea, which spans all of the Northern Plains, but too big. We would expect it to emanate from the foothills and parkland ecotone, leaving the boreal forest area east of the Rockies sometime after that eruption, the East Lobe eruption of the White River. Uh, I would think because then ancestors in the Peace and Slave River basins in the north we're familiar with wood bison and did hunt them sometimes communally, that it would not be a particularly difficult thing to transition from that species to communal plains bison hunting, adopting that type of economy. And if things went well, a population could grow in a fission and begin to create a dialect chain that would eventually exist in the south, extending from Navajo to other uh, speakers of Apachean languages on the plains. I haven't talked too much about it, but uh, Dene people everywhere seem to be very conservative about language. They don't borrow. And cultural identity is very intimately wrapped up with language. But material and ceremonial cultures is another thing altogether. Uh, Dene ancestors will very readily adopt and, and adapt uh, useful material culture and ceremonial beliefs from neighbors. We would expect that uh, small groups of Dene ancestors could have infiltrated southward. There's been a lot of debate about what this, was it an intermontane route or was it a high plains route? I think it could have been any or all of those things infiltrating these different routes. And as that process went on, many others would be joining these nascent societies, but especially women in the movement southward. For much of the geography of this, certainly in the Canadian Boreal Forest, the prospect of detecting this archaeologically, while it would have very low archaeological visibility. In subarctic regions, for instance, coniferous forests make for quite acidic soil conditions, and virtually everything but stone tools uh, will disappear from the archaeological record very quickly. It is amazing what we can learn from stone tools, their sources, their byproducts, and what have you. But it's a very narrow lens to think of something like cultural identity. So in many cases, as much as we might like to know something from the archaeological record, it's just not available there. Unless, unless you could encounter an archaeological record that was very rich. And that, in fact, is what the promontory caves reflect. A great basin colleague of mine, Robert Bettinger, seeing me speak about some of this in uh, Australia, at a conference in Australia, actually, sort of poked me in the ribs and said, Jack, if you're serious about this, you really need to look at the promontory cave materials that Julian Stewart, a famous anthropologist, worked with early in his career in 1930 and 1931. And as Bob said, those materials just don't belong in the Great Basin. They're just not typical of the Great Basin at all. And what, what he found, Stewart found, in those circumstances, is such a rich archaeological record. We don't find just the stone arrow tip, but we find the sinew binding the arrow foreshaft. We find the cane shaft of the arrow with its feather fletching. We find split feathers ready for fletching. We find matting. We find cordage, and various other perishable items. We find items of adornment. This is actually quite large on the screen, but it's really a little tiny, it's hollow bone. Uh, used as a, probably as a bracelet for a child. We find flattened porcupine quills, and those flattened porcupine quills are used to decorate clothing, moccasin vamps, and that type of thing. So suddenly now, here's an archaeological record where there's so much material culture, such a broader lens through which to ask the question, is this typical of the Great Basin? Does it have any northern ties, for example? One of the first tasks we said about then was to make accurate dating of promontory materials. There had been almost none. One moccasin had been, had been dated. And while this diagram may not look too impressive, it is in a way. These little blips here, we have about 150 uh, radiocarbon dates for our project. 95 of those dates come from promontory cave one. And in terms of the Bayesian modeling of the probabilities for those 95 dates, they all fit into these little blips here so that we came to understand that cave one with the very rich archeological record 
was occupied over a very brief period of time, between about AD 1240 and AD 1290. So literally, all the cultural material in that cave accumulated in a time span of maybe one or two human generations, if you consider that human generations come along about every 25 years. That cave occupation was contemporaneous at the end of it with the um, a late Fremont village, the only water source nearby, it's about four kilometers away, the only fresh water source of Great Salt Lake that the Promontory Cave occupants must have known about. There's enough radiocarbon data there that it, it becomes something you can ask questions of in its own right. We are able to date a number of things like moxins, which we'll see that have a northern connection, and other things that seem to have a southern connection. For example, items of basketry in, in particular. If Sapir and Stewart were correct in their surmising about this type of record, we would expect northern types of material culture to somewhat precede southern types of material culture. And that's exactly what we can see in the Bayesian, Bayesian modeling of these materials here. So a 13th century occupation, and this is not occurring at just any time. It's occurring in one of the periods between AD 1000 and AD 1300, a final period of severe regional drought is going on. There's a topic I'll return to here. So that's when this occupation took place. One of the things uh, that was typical of Stewart's era was uh, failing to recover all the faunal assemblage that existed. He brought back a representative sample, and there had been some museum attrition of that. So a legitimate question would be, maybe the emphasis that Stewart put on a large game hunting, a bison hunting economy, was maybe a bit misplaced. If he didn't screen and float for seeds, that type of thing, perhaps that might not be accurate. But Stewart had this absolutely correctly. In our excavations, I at times felt that I was at a Plains bison field. There are multi-species, they're not all bison, but multi-species bone beds inside the cave that are really quite profound. So here you see me picking up um, a female bison skull here, one of our graduate students, Aileen Riley, picking up a bison forelimb. In a plain setting, one would talk about how all aspects of the bison were used from head to tail. And you can see that in the promontory caves. There's a bison tail rattle on the left that Stuart recovered. There's the skull that I was holding in the center. And there's that word again, horn or um, a horn spoon, because the bison horn is the other thing you can make a spoon, this one, or a scoop out of in terms of handling food. One of the more dramatic discoveries was a hearth clearing uh, area. We excavated a tiny portion of it, but got multiple screen loads of this burned bone, about 6,500 fragmentary pieces of bone. The feature itself must be much larger. Uh, the number of large game animals, bison in particular, being killed in the promontory case, when we finally complete our osteological analysis, is certain to be a very large number. These were very sophisticated and skilled hunters living in the cave. But the other thing that's noteworthy is that in the partially burned bone, you see these residues of hair. So those are fats and greases that are still adhering to the bone. The people doing this almost certainly would have known how to use boiling to extract those valuable fats and greases, but in this case, they weren't. These things were being burned. And so we're very suspicious that in fact, there was feasting activity going on. So economically speaking, this was a community that was doing very well, would be the conclusion we would reach. Now we were floating and screening. Very little evidence of seed use. Our colleague Dave Rode is working on, on this. And in Pumptree Cave 1, no maize whatsoever. So corn or maize was not a factor at this time in the northeastern corner of the Great Basin. In terms of thinking about a bison economy, this severe period of drought can be related to changing bison dynamics. Judith Cooper's work at Southern Methodist University, I find quite um, insightful in this regard. This part of the Northwestern Plains region, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Montana was always the heart of intensive communal bison hunting. But what you can see as time goes on here is that in Texas, Oklahoma, and so on, no evidence of very large or moderately large communal kills. 
But as time goes forward and we enter the Little Ice Age, a time period when forage likely improved because of greater moisture on the northern plains, we see larger kills beginning to appear. And finally, in, as the uh, 13th century goes by, back here, we see very large kills beginning to appear as far south as Texas. If we were looking for something that would draw a people farther south, I suspect these changing bison population dynamics would be just the thing. How to explain everything that there is? There's a lot that we could talk about in the commentary case. Well, one of the consulting archaeologists in Alberta is also a very good artist, Amanda Dow. And we asked Amanda to create this um, artist representation of the caves. There's very little artistic license in here. Almost everything that you see in, in the, the, the painting that, that Amanda made, uh, we can warrant with archaeological information, even little things like in this part of the cave and here where people's hands or feet touch down on the rock as they move through them, they're worn smooth to touch, they're polished. There's certainly lots of evidence of hide processing that we'll talk about necessary for the clothing and moccasins and much moccasin repair and sewing. We'll see that children were a significant part of the demography of the caves and probably dogs. Gaming, the promontory cave occupants loved gaming. We'll talk a little bit about that. All kinds of games that were being played by this population. Um, and some interesting technological things. Uh, Julian Stewart recovered a sinew back bow. So this would be the first compound type of bow to appear in the greater Great Basin Southwestern region. So let's go through maybe a few of the details that we'll see here. Julian Stewart, as you can see from this quote, reached the conclusion that this was not typical Great Basin material culture. He was very familiar with the various Nomic speakers in the Great Basin, Paiute, Ute, Shoshone. Um, he could see this material culture did not resemble that. And he voiced the suspicion then that perhaps this is a trace of Apachean ancestors passing by on their way to the south. So on the left here, we can see um, uh, the conditions when Stewart was working. It was a, a very large excavation in 1930 and 1931. And here are examples of promontory moccasins that he recovered. Now, there are many moccasins in the caves. We are aware of approximately 350 in different collections, most at the Natural History Museum of Utah, some that we have recovered and some in other uh, collections. Uh, one of my graduate students, Jan Hollison, has done work on accumulation studies that I'll mention a bit later. And a realistic estimate for the number of moccasins that are or were, because there are extensive deposits in, the, in cave one still, the number of moccasins would like to be on the order of about 2,500 discarded, worn out pairs of moccasins. That sounds like a large number, but because moccasins wear out fairly quickly, they're discarded. And the lower portion of a moccasin doesn't have much further use, so it, it, it gets discarded. Um, what made Stewart think that this had some northern connection? Well, he was aware from the work of the Goodman Hat earlier of northern moccasins that look like this. So these are leggings and moccasins from a Dene population, Taltan, in northern British Columbia, for example. And you don't actually have to be very good at this to see that this is a very similar style of construction. So in getting into this, here are the patterns that Stewart laid out for the construction of a promontory moccasin. And they can be anywhere from two to four pieces, depending on whether you have a vamp and then maybe an inset that goes with that, and depending on whether an ankle wrap is attached to it. But the basic pattern is to take a larger piece here and have it fold upward and meet uh, an instep or vamp piece that needs to be joined and leaves you joined and leaves you with this puckered rounded toe. Now, Fremont footwear from contemporaneous Great Basin societies came in two or three forms, one being a hawk moccasin where you would use this part of an ungulate's leg and close off the toe. And another being these really unusual Fremont moccasins, which are, as Mal Aiken said, kind of built from the top down rather than the bottom up. Uh, after I had spoken with, with uh, my colleague, Bob Bettinger, I had asked uh, my friend, Terry Sawyer, who was doing sewing for a major exhibition we were doing in our museum, 
if she could make me a pair of moccasins, because Terry was one of the few people that could still do the elaborate quill work you can see here. And that really took me aback. I could see exactly what Stuart was getting at. And as our research went on, I was really delighted to find that in one of the northern circumstances where we do get fantastic preservation in the Yukon ice pastures, which unfortunately are receding because of climate change, a moccasin had been discovered. Now this moccasin is about 700 years older than the promontory moccasins, but it's the same basic pattern of uh, lower portion coming up to meet with puckering of um, the upper part of, of a moccasin. So that looks like an antecedent form, but it's way up in the Northwestern homeland, you would expect. This is what typical Fremont footwear looks like. Here's a hawk moccasin here. This is barely leather. It's really not entirely um, stripped of fur. You see, there's a very rough, thick cord to stitch every inch or so. It's completely unlike what we see with the promontory moccasins. There is variability in the promontory moccasins. It's actually very interesting, the variability. But some of the work in the promontory moccasins is unbelievably highly scaled going the wrong way here. And here's one example of one of the better decorated moccasins that join at the puckering for the seam is covered by basketry wrap cord that's placed over it to disguise the seam. And you can see now flattened porcupine quills being used as part of a decorative motif. And as I always say with this, usually the very fine sinew that's used to lock those quills down, usually four quills at a time, this artisan was locking down each piece of quill with this very fine sinew. Now there's no stainless steel needles, there's no artificial light, that type of thing. But the person who sewed this moccasin by anybody's standards at any times was an exquisitely skilled artisan. It's, it's just beautifully, beautifully made work. A question you could ask though is, well, but maybe that kind of moccasin was just more widespread in North America. So we've done some looking around and uh, actually Ben and I were talking about this at, at the outset. There are other kinds of footwear that we see that are roughly contemporaneous. In fact, some of, some of these instances, there are five of them in the promontory caves. In about this time range, one common form of footwear was almost like a hide or leather sandal where you uh, have these looping drawstrings um, that would go through. Here's one from Oklahoma all the way over into the Ozarks here. And of course, if you go very much farther south into the Southwestern world, then you're into a world of even more fiber perishables and sandals like this. So in Stewart's terms, the promontory moccasins really did stand out as something completely different from what one would expect for that part of the world. The moccasins are really evocative. And you can see with F here, this is a little child's moccasin, maybe the first moccasin a child might receive in the ceremony, and it would, it would fit in the palm of your hand. And in working with these materials, which is so moving, it's very moving for any of us because in a human sense, you just innately, you can sense another person. You can see the imprint of their foot, that, that type of thing. It's very moving for indigenous people. Um, it began to occur to me that there was a, a lot of information in the sizes of the moccasins because the length of our foot for much of our life, at least until our teenage years, is actually a very good predictor of our stature. And our stature, uh, in that interval is a very good predictor of our age. So here's a plotting of the um, of actual Apachean stature and foot length data with a plot of the promontory moccasins. And you can see how incredibly closely the uh, moccasins track that sizing. We can actually fit in, there's that Yukon Ice Coast book, so we can actually fit in these other moccasins. See, perhaps a 10 year old individual. The little moccasin we'll see from Franktown Cave in Colorado, probably a five or six year old child would wear that, would wear that moccasin. It gets confusing in here where adult females and maturing males um, may produce a similar foot size. But the striking thing about all this was that more than 80% of the moccasins came from children and sub-adults. And now thinking back to that feasting and the tremendous hunting success this population had, 
Here then, one would suspect we have a growing population, so many children. We're aware that there would be a discard bias, like adult males, for example, would be much more likely to throw a moccasin away while away from camp. So there's a bit of bias, but such a large figure suggests that this was a really successful population that had many children. And of course it takes a lot of leather uh, to produce those moccasins. We're seeing the ones that are worn out, the not new, they're worn out and being discarded, but of course you would have to replace those. So lots of hide processing. And we see a variety of fleshing implements from very finely crafted ones to more expedient ones. This is a bison scapula that's being used for beaming, probably to remove hair from a hide. And then this very distinctive type of stone implement here. Now there were lots of scrapers, and these are the light obsidian scrapers from the Thaumaturgy Caves that Stewart found. And he, he thought there was an unusual number of these for the Great Basin, but that's not very conclusive. When I saw this from a Northern perspective, I thought, wow, in the Canadian and Alaska North, that would be called a tabular biface or a chivo, that's a Dene word actually, taught to Friedrich Rene by Panama women in, in Alaska. It's used for a variety of functions, particularly scraping functions, but especially to soften a hide, to give it that fine buckskin or suede-like texture. So you can see this one here caught my eye. Here's an ethnographic one uh, from Gwich'in country up in the Northern Yukon. Uh, here's one that's really well dated because that student that I mentioned, Aileen Riley, worked with a skilled Dene woman, Auntie Maida, as she was known in the Akaska community there. And she made Alien one in August of, of 2012. They're very intriguing objects. It takes seconds almost, a minute or two to make one, to chip it out, and it might be discarded very easily. But as Auntie Maida explained to Aileen, if a woman liked one particularly, it might actually become an heirloom. Her daughters and her daughter's daughters might actually inherit it. They certainly occur uh, on Promontory Point. Here's an avocational collection that was made uh, that's, that's full of them. Now, when doing this kind of research, you know, well, maybe these types of implements, they were common in the Great Basin too, anyway. But in working with people like Joel Janetsky, who has probably forgotten more about Great Basin archaeology than many of us will know, Joel didn't recognize this, this at all. So this was another interesting signification of something that appears to have to reflect a Northern heritage and would also be out of place in Utah. Um, I had the great pleasure of supervising Libby Goldberg, one of Edge Lee's students, uh, who came up to Canada to work uh, on some of the promontory materials. And she made some very interesting discoveries, the most striking of which was this very unusual form of what is known as plat synod rating. Here is uh, uh, an artifact uh, from Promontory Cave 1, where you can see this style of rating. You see how intricate it is? It's very difficult to do. And here Libby has color coded it so you can have some idea of how this braiding is taking place uh, with these three separate strands here. Now, Ed uh, knew, and in talking to people um, familiar with great uh, basin uh, records, Kay Fowler in particular, not before documented in the Great Basin. So very uncommon or unheard of until that point. But where else did Libby find it? Well, she found it in the Canadian North. So here's one from Northern Alberta, where you can see that style of plat synod rating being used as the handle for a birch bark vessel. Uh, things like this, there's an incredibly fine senior one that would be used for mitten strings, for legging or moccasin garters, that type of thing. So here's another unusual thing. Here we're looking at uh, an example, an assembling example of a dog travois of which there are very few examples. The other thing that came up in Libby's thesis and that another of our PhD students, actually Kate Latham has worked on was this object, which was a bit of a, what's it for us? It came from Stewart's collections. Our best estimation of this is it is part of a dog travois, a dog travois basket, suggesting that some degree of dog uh, transport, not unheard of in the Great Basin, but, but rather unusual once again. Not everything is unfamiliar from a Great Basin perspective. And here are two that I would highlight. One that Libby and, and Ed Jolie uh, helped us with. There's not much basketry, which is common in the Great Basin. Uh, 14 instances between stewards and our smaller excavated 
example. But here is this one with its technical description, close coiled one or one half log non-interlocking stitch. This was a typical Great Basin form that persisted into the Fremont world and then vanishes with the end of Fremont material culture. This, Ed tells me, is the youngest dated specimen of this particular form of basketry. So it's either entering the cave or perhaps being made by someone in the cave who's familiar with doing this, like he did a Fremont person. The other extensive research that uh, has been accomplished is by another of my PhD students, Gabriel Yanecki, who comes to the conclusion that the pottery that we see in the promontory assemblages was very likely Fremont inspired. In fact, Uinta Gray may be the inspiration for the particular forms of pottery that we see in Promontory Cave One. There is also some, and this is very interesting from a Dismal River and Plains perspective, there's also some highly micaceous pottery uh, in the Promontory Assemblage, uh, mica rich pottery that may even be self tempering. You can see the the um, mica glittering away here. Uh, so the inference that uh, these researchers have reached is that they very likely are women entering the Palmetary Cave Society and they are coming with their own suite of skills, which may include this particular form of basketry and making pottery. And to make some sense of this, I should say that in all of the uh, Northwestern reach of North America over the Dene homeland, Pottery is not known except for instances where there are uh, Yupik or Inuit uh, communities near some very far northern Dene communities. Otherwise, there is no archaeological tradition of pottery whatsoever. So that this was a skill set that Apachean ancestors picked up someplace in their sojourn heading toward the south. I mentioned gaming. Uh, the promontory cave inhabitants must have loved gaming. There are all kinds of gaming implements. Here we see a, a, a slab that was used for playing the cane dice game. Uh, we've recovered about 150 cane uh, dice. We calculate that in the entire set of deposits, there might be as many as 8,000 of these uh, fried mites, cane uh, dice. You can see this pattern here on a, an ochred and decorated object, very similar to what you would see with that Hopi playing slab. There are porcupine and beaver tooth uh, dice some of them with rather plains-like um, uh, markings on them. This is probably part of a shuttlecock from the snow snake or some other type of shuttlecock again. Uh, this might be a quill flattener, but it might also be a piece that would be used in the hand game, a hiding game that's played extensively in the North where contestants have to guess who might be hiding an object. There are hoops. These are often referred to as, as uh, pottery rests, but the, you know, they don't have charcoal and whatnot on them, and they, they may well be hoops for playing that hoop game. And this one certainly is. This is a, a willow bend into a hoop with a, a lacing across it. And this is probably a dart used to play that game. So a game where the hoop is rolled and a dart or arrow or even a spear is thrown at the hoop as it rolls. There's even a ball, a little uh, juniper bark ball. And we don't know, but in the Apachean world, one of the games that's played predominantly is another hiding game, the moccasin game, where an object is hidden in a buried moccasin and other contestants have to guess which moccasin might hold the object. And the object is frequently a ball, I understand, from the ethnographic literature. So the Promontory Cave people were very interested in gaming. We have been interested in looking at specific material consequences of migration. No one migrates somewhere they know nothing about. Certainly the gaming activity that Gabe has talked about, Gabe and Nikki, the promontory people, unlike their Fremont neighbors, knew about games all over Western North America, the variety of things that we're seeing. Uh, that would be one form of contact because as you can appreciate, moving farther south, you likely would begin to encounter languages that you couldn't speak, hadn't heard before. But gaming is another way of interacting with, with people. Uh, and we suspect gaming was significant in that fashion. What about finding out about things? Well, one of our little radiocarbon dating episodes that we had uh, led to a query. I was just interested in dating this moccasin fragment and there was a little piece on it, so not too destructive to snip a bit off and send off to the Oxford radiocarbon dating lab. And we got the date back and it was right in the range that we were expecting, a little over 700 years of age. But the next day, 
Fiona Brock and Linda Rayner got in touch and said, we should mention to you that the isotopic signature, the carbon-13 signature for that sample is unlike anything else that you have. And the gist of this is that the bison, this is bison leather, that was consuming, or the bison that led to this leather was consuming warm season grasses, okay? And the question that Joel and I began to work with immediately talking to Joan Coltrane and others was, is, is there any warm season grass forage available in the Palmetry area? And the answer to that is no. Well, what about the Snake River Plain? No, there's none up there either. Now this turned out to be a portion of the ankle wrap. So this is an ankle wrap for a moccasin. That's the one part of a moccasin that doesn't really wear out well, apart from the vamp. And they were frequently scavenged. They were cut off and could be reused. And this led to some brilliant work by Jess Metcalf who worked out a carbon-13 landscape, an isoscape, for where those warm seasons and grasses are. So here are the promontory caves here and that little piece of leather. And this area, this arc here, would be the only places that a bison could grow up consuming those warm season grasses, which would give you that Delta C13 signature. We think this is an instance prospectively of a scouting behavior where an ankle wrap, not the rest of the moccasin, but an ankle wrap made its way back to the promontory caves far, far away, seven or 800 kilometers, something like that. Now, in doing that work, Jess really wanted to know, is the leather coming from a cow or a male bison? Because bison are quite matriarchal in their herd uh, organization, and female bison are much less inclined to wander than a male bison. And you'd have to remember, too, that in making this transit, this is going into tissue, you begin consuming grasses that give you a different isotopic signature. Well, it turned out uh, that I could ask uh, Bess Shapiro and one of her students, Sabrina Shiraz, that question, was this a male or a female bison? And they worked out a way to determine that in fact was a female bison, which diminished the prospect for any explanation of this being a wandering bison. So we do suspect that this is a return visiting or perhaps forward scouting taking place from the promontory caves, of course, into areas that Apogean ancestors would eventually inhabit. Of course, that led me to ask the question of Beth and Sabrina. Well, if it's not too hard to do, we have all these other moccasin samples that we've radiocarbon dated. Could we find out if they're male or female? And a really intriguing pattern came to light. We know in a plains context that many people preferred to hunt cow calf herds. Bison behavior made them more malleable, more appropriate uh, for hunting. And I better not digress too much into that. But here's the result. What Sabrina, under best direction, did was so clever. To determine whether it was male or female bison hide, you'd want to know, is there twice as much X chromosome material for female instances? So here are modern population data for bison, showing a clear break between males and females. And here is the commentary cave data. So there were three males in that data set, a couple for robes, I think, one moccasin, and all the other moccasins are being made from female bison hide leather. Now we think that is because you're looking for two things in making a moccasin. You're looking for durability. It needs to be thick enough to last. And actually deer and antelope and other things will not last as well. But it also has to be pliable or flexible enough so that an artisan can apply the skills that you were just seeing. Male bison hide can be as much as um, a centimeter thick and would be too, too thick to sew adequately. So there was a real preference for using female bison hide leather as the raw material for the moccasins. And that may, that may have in turn uh, been related to a preference to exploit uh, cow calf herds, which we certainly see in Plains setting. There are also long distance uh, connections back to the north. Really extraordinary set of rock art images in a place called Grotto Canyon. Some of you might know where Banff, Alberta is. This is not too far from Banff uh, in the um, front ranges of the Rockies. This is calcite covered and you can actually walk by the panel and not see it at first. It's an unusual setting. It's in this narrow passageway. Here is an enhanced image uh, from Hillary McDonald who has spent hours photographing this in different ways. 
de-stretching and other things to enhance or elaborate the images. And you can see that there's a complete panel here. I, I think it's a composition with perhaps some ceremonial activities here, a zigzag line here. What attracted all the attention here was this appears to be a flute plane or hunchback figure. Here's another figure here, a series of elk, and then a series of figures in a line here. Hillary was out there when it was cold at night. She turned her camera up at one point and it's spectacular, a squawk of stars revealed in, in Grotto Canyon. So here's that image again. It's quite striking and it's very clear that this is the Fremont world visiting southwestern Alberta because this rock art is completely out of place in southwestern Alberta. There's nothing else like it. Rock art in Alberta doesn't look like this at all. So what's that about? Well, my colleagues, Marty Magni and Mike Fussen, got some medical imaging of this previously so that you could see through that calcite veneer and clearly see this is a hunchback figure of some type. They're commonly called Pocatelli figures. This figure up here appears to be holding something that seems to be a bow spear above the elk. Actually talking to Val Geist, the great ethologist for, for uh, cervids, tells us the time of year this took place. That male elk, the one with the antlers, is in a low head posture. That's the posture they assume when they're bugling and assembling a harem of, of uh, female and younger animals. And here is this line of figures down here amplified. There is rock art in um, Promontory Cave One. And here are the two images here and here that Stuart recorded that I'll focus on. The one image is amazingly fresh. It's still inside the cave and you can see it very clearly. This is harder to decipher his drawing of this one, but here is a de-stretched image with false color. It's ochre, uh, but um, actually my student, Andrea Lentz, who worked on this was red, green colorblind. So <laughs> this is actually how he got involved in doing this, using false color, a classic Fremont figure with probably plumes, certainly hair bob, uh, a variety of things we would associate with Fremont rock art. Um, here, also from Utah, is a line of figures. You don't have to be any good at rock art to see that whoever made this rock art in Grotto Canyon in southwestern Alberta knew exactly how Fremont era rock art was being made in Utah. How to interpret that? Well, it's a great distance. Here's promontory point here. There are some petroglyphs at Buffalo Eddy over at the Idaho border here uh, with Washington. Uh, with somewhat similar figures. Otherwise, nothing that we're aware of in between until all the way up here at Grotto Canyon. What does that mean? It's hard to say, but if it's occurring in one of these time periods when the Fremont world was being shot by drought that had an impact on this horticulture, that type of thing, perhaps it involved extensive journeying, such as some Hopi stories uh, to the land of ice and snow, of which there are oral traditions. Or perhaps Apachean ancestors who we'd expect to pass through this area were already exploring points to the south and maybe becoming familiar with this or inviting others uh, uh, to come back into this area. Whatever it is though, it shows very clearly that there's an avenue of communication across this vast distance between the Northeastern Great Basin world and Southwestern Alberta. There's lots that we could talk about. I'm coming to the end here. We do have a volume forthcoming uh, um, that will cover some of the things I can't today. I mean, we had linguists with us and it occurred to be interesting to make a soundscape for the cave and find out where some areas were more private than others. Um, I mentioned Jen Holson's work. She was able to use geographic information techniques to calculate the original volume of deposits in the cave so that we could actually use accumulation study formulae to project how many moxins, how many gaming pieces there could be in this bounded cave space. And uh, Scott Ewer has been working uh, at BYU on intensive laser scanning of the rock art and photogrammetry. We hope to be able to paint the very detailed, almost a billion points he's gathered, laser generated points with photogrammetric images that might one day allow a virtual visit uh, to the caves. So now to draw things a bit closer to, to end off here, um, the promontory moccasins are not entirely unique. They do occur in some other locations. One of them 
not so far from where you are, is on the Palmer Divide, south of Denver, um, in Frankdown Cave, where my colleagues, uh, Kevin Gilmore, who's done such excellent work with this existing collection, and Bonnie Clark, um, have um, worked with these collections from the 40s and 50s. And here we see a Charles Moxon in that promontory style in Franktown Cave, a fragment of legging with fringing, very similar to some that we have in uh, Promontory Cave 1. Here's a potsherd that, as Gabe Yannicki said, if that fell on the floor of Promontory Cave, it would attract no attention. Uh, very similar to the Promontory Pottery that we see there, but this in Colorado, and here is another of these hoops. These perishable objects that we can date are essentially contemporaneous with the Promontory Cave record in Utah. So this may be another place where people were stopping by and leaving this unique material culture, which now sort of gets stretched out of shape. We would call it the Promontory Phase early and late in Utah, but now we're getting so far away that I would call it the Promontory Phenomenon. These are artifacts that we can see might connect with that, but now they're getting very far away. The 13th century was a very turbulent time in terms of my understanding of Southwestern uh, pre-contact history. There are various ways of expressing this. Here's one from Barbara Mills and other authors that generally speaking seem to show diminishing populations in the Puebloan world and populations that are also aggregating into larger centers where there are more people. The, entire upshot of this appears to be the freeing up of large parts of the landscape where hamlets and villages once might have existed before. Now, doing some speaking for, for Scott Artman at the, um, at the um, um, in, in, um, in Boulder uh, in 2015, after talking a bit about this promontory material, Scott said to me, looking at uh, Osborne's work on the Weatherall materials, he said, aren't, aren't those promontory style moccasins that were recovered in Johnson Canyon, according to the weather oath? And there's a promontory moccasin here, and you can see how very similar they are. Lori Webster's helped us a great deal with this. Here's the actual moccasins in, in uh, color photography. These are made in the very same style, but now they're in Johnson Canyon near Mesa Verde uh, within what will become what is Denita. This was kind of not great how this happened. They broke through an adobe wall to find an internment of nine individuals where these moccasins were, a tunic, leggings, leather, not very typical of the Babylon world, and also this composite bow. Now, it's not a sinew back bow, but it's being wrapped by a heart or esophagus or gut or something to make it a composite bow. And they remarked that it would take an extremely powerful individual to draw this bow. So here is a composite bow suspected of appearing in the period from AD 1200 to AD 1400 in the Southwest and possibly introduced by Apachean ancestors. Then Laurie pointed out to us, she was working at the Smithsonian in 2018 when the SAAs were on, and she said, here's another one. And here's uh, a moccasin from Spruce Tree House recovered by Fuchs in the early part of the 20th century. And you see this is the very same kind of moccasin with that very fine puckering and gathering, some ochre decoration on the vamp. This is very like the promontory moccasins we're talking about. Over at Aztec Ruin, Edgley and, and Rory have pointed out to us another moccasin that's a little bit variant, but looks pretty much like that style. Uh, some very elaborate quill decoration applied here. And Ed has told me that the next youngest type of basketry of the type we were referring to before occurs at Aztec Ruin. Uh, of that type that we were mentioning. So these tantalizing traces of things uh, that appear uh, to connect to that promontory world. Um, whether this is, is a, a back a back to type of bow here with the scoring that you can see, this comes from the promontory cave. We know that Stewart recovered a fragment of bow with sinew backing. So that would be the earliest instance of a comp composite type of bow. Uh, appearing near the Southwest. And of course, I'm quite sympathetic to what um, uh, the village ecodynamics group of uh, authors are, are concluding that this was a world that was turbulent the 13th century. It was creating both challenges and opportunities. And I think for Apache and ancestors, but others, Nemec speakers, the youth of the Paiute, were having opportunities to enter this world 
where significant change was affecting Puebloan societies. Much more can be said about that. I always remind myself and my students, getting back to the whole theme, there's so much we never know archeologically, even when the record is extremely rich. Here are things that I think we can be reasonably sure of from our investigations at Pondicherry. There's no doubt this was a sophisticated bison hunting, large game hunting population. And they were living in proximity to Fremont communities and Fremont material culture by the end of the 13th century would, would disappear. They were sophisticated bison hunting. It is intrusive. The artifact assemblages in many respects, the moccasins, the hide working implements, are very distinct from what neighboring populations are using. It does look like there's archaeological evidence for significant ethnogenesis, because if the basketry and the pottery, perhaps the gaming, are telling us that other people are joining in the cave population uh, that's taking shape. And I think this provides a basis for thinking that it was a foundation for the intense plains Puebloan relationships, interaction, that would be characteristic after the 13th century. If we move that forward to thinking more explicitly and interpretively, does it reflect Apache and ancestry? Well, there are a few, few concluding thoughts I would have. If we think about what Den ancestors did, it really went against the entire grain. Um, they came from a land that's the best watered environment in North America. There's scads of water, and they moved into an area that was extremely arid. Other people were experiencing difficulty with maize horticulture. Uh, Dene ancestors began to have a tribe at it, starting out as hunter gatherers, but taking it up. And in terms of Wade Campbell's work, you know, we see that that uh, once sheep and goats arrive, uh, sheep and goats arrive, then pastoralism uh, becomes something that Dene ancestors take up. This was a really turbulent 13th century. Cahokia collapses, Fremont disappears, massive change in the Puebloan world. Um, all these events, including the arrival of some other people from the north, would forever change that southern world. Uh, Apache and other societies had the chance to fill interstitial parts of the landscape, I think. And in doing so, they could create a spectrum of relationship with neighbors that would range from very cordial ones, such as Yukari Apache ancestors had with their Pueblo neighbors, to other ones, maybe farther south in the plains, that, that were more aggressive and could involve raiding and warfare. And as this was taking place, there was profound and creative ethnographic change, or ethnogenetic, I should say, change going on. I think of the gathering of the clans and discussion, picking out specific words. If you look at the Water's Edge clan that's described, the ninth clan to arrive, it sounds very like the primary population. From a gender perspective, women were really important in the change that was going on. Who was making the moccasins? Who was making the fine quality leather? Who was making the bison products that could be traded? It was women. They were very active agents of the change that was going on. And at the end of the day, uh, Apachean speakers would become by far the largest Native American group, not just in the Northwest, uh, Southwest and, and Southern Plains, but in all of Western North America. I, I understand there are estimates of about 800,000 or more Dene speaking people in Western North America. And a bit of a lesson for our times here. The droughts that are predicted by climatologists, as we can see with this article here, said to ensue in this coming century, remind us that we should, in fact, be paying attention to the significant changes that have occurred uh, in the last thousand to two thousand years. There are many people to thank you, especially my colleague, uh, Bruce Starlet, who we can see. Actually, Bruce is giving a name, a Dene name, to Paddy Timbimbo of the Northwest Shoshone people, where the promontory caves are today. It is their traditional country. And we are especially grateful to George and Kumara Chernos um, uh, in the lower right hand corner there, the current owners of the caves. George and Kumara have protected these caves from the depredations that have affected so many other caves. And we became friends, and they work with us on a daily basis as we work in the caves. Um, a wonderful couple. And Kumaro, as you might recognize from her name, is a Maori person. So um, it gave us a very intriguing Indigenous perspective on our work as we proceeded. That's what I had for you today. I've probably gone a bit too long, uh, but I'm happy to answer questions at this point. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Well, thank you so much, Jack. That was just amazing. Uh...
Yeah, so why don't you go ahead and you can leave your slides up, maybe go back so at least we can see some pretty pictures as, as we ask some questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we have a number of questions and let's see here, some people put theirs in the chat, so it'll take me a second to get through them all. But um, okay. so just at the very basic scale, somebody asked if you could just re explain where the caves are, just even, you know, generally. Yes, um, must be a map somewhere. Promontory Point is a long finger that sticks down from the north part of Great Salt Lake. Gotcha. So then these so are. It's, it, it's it's across from um, uh, Salt Lake City is just a bit to the southeast of where the Promontory Caves are. I've got scads of maps of that. I guess I didn't put one in here, but it's it's that long finger of land that extends down from the north shore of Great Salt Lake. Great, great. Um, another person asked, you know, could the hoop that you talked about be useful in the production of moccasins at all? Or are you sure that it's for that, that, uh, that game you were talking about? I don't think so. I mean, some elaborate quill braiding or, or weaving involves a little bow-like arrangement, uh, but I don't, I don't see how that could be. And in other ethnographic knowledge of hoop games, the pattern of the of the lines that crisscross it, how an arrow or a dart or a spear falls on that is actually part of the scoring. I don't know how that works, but it was actually part of the scoring system uh, that the contestants were using. So two people would stand together, one would roll the hoop and they would both chase after it and then throw an arrow or in some cases the hoops were quite large or a dart or something like that. And how everything fell influenced how you scored what you did. Interesting, interesting. Um, another question is what makes you suggest that the moccasin makers were women? Is there ethnographic evidence that that's normally the case or, or what do you think? That's a really good question. And inherently we think that, and certainly in my, mm, ethno-archaeological experience or working with many people, it's mainly women. But in Bruce's community, the Sultana community, in recent years, the best moccasin maker has been a man. And it's an assumption that we're making. And I, from reading Navajo ethnography, uh, it would seem that men were, able, were expected to be able to make their own moccasins and that women only made moccasins for men if they were just hopeless at it. Uh, so, so it's a gendered assumption we should be careful about. There is an interesting word in the Mackenzie Basin that Raymond Yakalaya told me about. Uh, it's a way of describing a person. And the Dene word is Michaela. And it refers to a person who's good at everything. And there certainly could be people in a society who could be great hunters, good at this, good at that. And that being good at could, might include moccasin making. So that it's a really good question. That's assumption. It's an assumption we make. Erica Sutherland, one of my students, is wanting to look at the the variability in the moccasins because I've showed you some really high skill ones. Other ones are not very high skill. And if you begin to think about this, how do you learn? And if you talk to women in Dene or Cree or other societies, I mean, it's very common to hear my mom got me started or my aunt got me started, and I would sew it. And she would say, that's not good enough, tear it out and do it again, and do it again, <laughs> and do it again, right? Until you began to perfect that skill. And there's a whole interesting area of pedagogy. You know what we do? Teach, 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 learn, 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 do an exam, now you're qualified. By and large in the indigenous world, that, that's nowhere. <laughs> you show that you're qualified by your capacity to do something well. And that's an act of doing of things. So I think there's a lot to be learned and I think that's why this material culture is important. You know, the, I guess what I want to say is the promontory collection Stuart made kicked around in the hallways in Salt Lake City for about 80 years until uh, uh, with a White House grant, people like Kathy Kankainen and Nancy Odegaard, who was involved in the restoration of some, brought it back to life. But these can be incredibly powerful things for re reinvigorating traditions that people now want to explore and use their own language around today, that, that, that type of thing. So uh, there's a whole world of thinking about how do you, how do you learn, thinking about pedagogy uh, and the variability in it. 
I mentioned the basketry, that type of thing. There may have been young women entering that society who, who didn't come from a, a leather and hide processing tradition like that, but they knew something else, maybe how to make pottery or basketry in that particular form. If they began to assume some mocks and making skills, and I said women, didn't I? I mean, I'm <laughs> back in that gen gender case, there would be a learning period where you wouldn't be as, as adept at it as you might become later. That very finely done moccasin that I showed you, that's got to be a lifetime experience that whoever made that moccasin, that's just, it's so good. Yeah. Well, and you also pointed out too that a lot of, or most of them, like you said, are for children. So I guess one could assume that at least the youngest ones are probably not making their own moccasins. So somebody, whether male or female or, or whatever, had to, had to make them for them and, and show them how to do it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. That was great. Um, yeah. And, and actually that brought up another uh, topic that um, there's a question about, but then also I know here at Crow Canyon and other, other colleagues of mine, there's actually seems to be a pretty substantial movement, at least in the Southwest. And I don't know if it's, it's happening up in Canada as well, where um, indigenous people are engaging with archeologists and other folks to have footwear making workshops and uh, to bring different uh, tribes or just different segments of communities together to kind of reinvigorate those technologies. And that's, that's something that, of course, um, you know, we support really uh, wholeheartedly is, you know, the, the reinvigoration of, of technologies. And in a way that's really significant to decolonizing um, uh, anthropological perspectives. Um, it really is, and I greatly value opportunities like this because wherever we talk about this, there's a great deal of interest, and we're not a very large group. There's more interest than we can fulfill, but we would like to, to make people aware of these collections, that they can be seen for that, and we'd certainly like at some point to host um, opportunities where really skilled sewers uh, can come together and look at this and evaluate that. I can think of moments where looking at moccasins in our University of Alberta collections where Denny women came in and they're looking at collections that were made at the turn of the 20th century. And I could hear them speaking with each other and they knew who made the moccasins by how the moccasins were made. Wow. And there's just a whole world of things that are there. There's a great phrase I use it in, in the book that an Ontario archaeologist has come up with. It's from an archaeologist's perspective, relinquishing the inception of research. Increasingly, archaeologists are, as we were talking about residential schools before we started, working at the direction of first nation communities. What do indigenous communities want? Is there something they want done that archaeologists can help with? The other great service I think we can have is to take these collections, many of which have existed for a long time, and make sure people in indigenous communities are aware of them and can put them to the active use that you just mentioned. No, that's that's really amazing. Well, I'm I'm really glad to hear you say that. That's 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 uh, inspirational for both myself and I'm sure many of the viewers. Um, well, yeah. So getting back to some some of the other questions, I know we have a bunch here, and I, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, let's see here. So uh, there was a, a question about what, in terms of just the terminology you're using, why are you using Apachean rather than Athabascan? Uh, is there some mm -hmm. reason for that or, or you know, what, what's your thought process there? Um, at least in Canada, and this is, it's not the simplest thing to do, but Athabascan is actually a Cree word. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a particular vegetation form at the mouth of the Athabasca River at Lake Athabasca. So, I mean, if you ask Dene people from as far away as Alaska, they have, they have no idea. What that means and there's a legitimate question as to why why would we go by that when we have our own ethnonyms in the canadian north Dene is one that's pretty widespread it has linguistic variability it can be dingy it can be Dana, a variety of things but um it's better uh, than using a word that eight 19th century philologists happen to use for the language film so i know where you are Dene, or or the or other other terms would be better. There's not a perfect solution to this, but um, that's why you see some variability. And I, I know our colleagues like Matt Hill and Sarah Trapert and whatnot are specifically using and they 
at, at the request of Apachean communities. So I know Apachean is not a perfect term either, uh, but we're trying to move away from that. Bruce Starlight will appease me. Um, if he hears me, you're using the A word again when I'm saying Athab Athabascan, um, because there are other ethnonyms that we could use. That's a kind of a kind of explanation for that then. No, and that's that's great. Well, and, and, and we're always, as archaeologists, as scientists, you know, trying to accommodate um, and understand and, and move forward with with that terminology. I know in the Southwest we had, of course, um, the use of ancestral Pueblo versus Anasazi has gone through somewhat of a similar trajectory. It sounds like, but yeah. Uh, the work's never done, right? Um, so there's a question from a colleague of ours, Alan Dart, and it's kind of long, so I'll just read it, I guess. Um, it says, in the Southwestern ancestral Pueblo cultures, sandals apparently were the main kind of footwear until around 1300, um, after which sandals were pretty much replaced by moccasins. It's my understanding that Fremont peoples used moccasins earlier than 1300. Um, so do you think there's a reason for these footwear adoption and changes maybe related, are they related to the, let's see, influence of moccasin using Apache ancestors coming into the area around 1200? Do you have any thoughts on the Fremont side of that, I guess, is what the tree is trying to get at. Um, why moccasin yeah. earlier on up there? Yeah, th that is longstanding and it does predate the promontory deposits, which come right at the end of the Fremont era. Uh, I do think that as, as far as ago as what the 40s or 50s, Solon, uh, there has been a suspicion that maybe leather footwear was introduced by Apachean ancestors to the Southwest and then took off from there. And the timing's pretty suspicious now, <laughs> uh, uh, in and around AD 1300. All these locations we're talking about, Franktown Promontory, by the, the 13th century, you are in ready striking distance of the American Southwest and the Southern. Southern Plain. So, so to me, two, two things. This, this does mean that, that ancestors were already entering those environments at, at earlier dates than are commonly accepted or have been commonly accepted by some. And yes, they could have been agents for a variety of things, uh, certain uh, art forms, heart lines and that type of thing, certain forms of quiver, um, leather footwear itself, um, and composite bow technology would be the would be the other things that might have been introduced. I should qualify that in saying that all the bows that we know of and they exist in the, in the ice patch record and whatnot in the north are self bows. They are not composite bows, despite proximity to the Inuit and, and Yupik world. But uh, there were sophisticated bow using uh, societies such as Avonlea in the northern plains, where. Uh, a composite bow technology might have been picked up by by Apachean ancestors. Um, that's not a fact, but it's it's a reasonable supposition. Hmm. Interesting. So um, another question we have is how far south? And you talked about this a little bit, but just if you could maybe reframe that, how far south do these promontory moccasins uh, appear? So I think you talked about Johnson Canyon, Mesa Verde, Aztec uh, in New Mexico. Anything south of that? Uh, uh, getting into the Santa Fe area, Otawi Pueblo, there's one, uh, one uh, Erica found, found one in a small museum collection there. It came from a dry cleft near the Puebloan community. So that far south uh, is what we know right now. Um, could be farther south for all we know. I don't think anyone's looks systematically is the thing. It's right. sort of in the, the what's it category that we were talking about. We, Sometimes when we don't know about things, we just, well, let's put that in that drawer sort of thing. <laughs> right. Well, and like I was mentioning to you before the talk, when I was doing my museum work, looking at ancestral Pueblo sandals, there were quite a few leather sandals. Um, and they, as they dry, they, you know, they shrink up and shrivel up and you could tell like, oh, that was probably a piece of footwear, but that was about it. Yeah. It was much more extensive analysis. So it probably, I, I would concur there's probably a lot more out there that that people just need to look for so um maybe and i get a big call for new students <laughs> and i don't know if there's something intervening because these are soft sold moccasins and and really in terms of goodman hats work they're typically associated with snowshoeing you need to have a soft sole for snowshoeing you you can see by how many are worn out people often ask um about that wear factor and could children outgrow them 
I, I think there's very little chance of that because they're more stocking like than modern footwear like. So you, you wear them out quickly. And if you look at historic literature, if someone's going on a journey, we'll give that person six pairs of moccasins and they would certainly carry repairing material too. So they wear out very quickly. At, at some point, uh, Apache style moccasins are going to involve a rawhide sole and then a soft upper. And it, it makes me wonder if at some point people doing all these repairs and sewing would say, this is not working very well in this terrain and this rough and rocky terrain, something different is required because there's a shift at some point into that form with right. you know the kick, the kick up toe and, and that sort of thing. Interesting, interesting. Um, so um, somebody put a question in the chat that I wanted to get at Tim Kohler, our colleague from Washington State University. Let's see if I can find it. Um, so, okay, here it is. Um, so yeah, so given, this is what Tim asks, given ancestral, Pueb or sorry, ancestral Apachean at Promontory by 1240, um, how likely do you think it is that they got down to the Four Corners before 1280? And if so, what role do you think they had in the depopulation of the region by farmers, which was complete by 1280? So, you know, we, you've you already mentioned that, yeah, they're probably at these ancestral Pueblo cliff dwellings, uh, Mesa Verde and, and Aztec. Um, but uh, do you think, do you have any indication that they could have contributed to the depopulation by ancestral Pueblo peoples or what, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I do. And, and uh, I've, I've never corresponded or, or talked with Tim, but I'm a great admirer of your whole project work Tim, uh, and read it assiduously. Um, yeah, I do, I do think it could have been a factor, but I think also if you think of Sunday Isles work with Hikaria records, there, there could easily be a spectrum of relationships that could range from cordial to, to more hostile. I think for Apachean ancestors, it was a relatively dangerous world. You wouldn't, wouldn't know. And in fact, in the book, I talk a bit about that. I mean, the promontory caves are, are a good place to live, but they're hyper defensible. <laughs> there would be no sneaking up there. You can see for miles and if people had cobbles at bows and so on and so forth, you could defend yourself very well. That makes you wonder, if places like Franktown and Promontory were selected, because if you needed to, you could adequately defend yourself. So I, I, I don't know, and I, but I just see, a, I sometimes think in my mind, it's more like inner Asia. There, there could be raiding and trading. People made situational decisions. And in some cases people would, as in the Hikaria cases, I understand it from Sundays and others were a lot of interdigitation inter, digitization, people stepping, as Seb Fowler's work with Sunday, stepping back and forth across uh, cultural boundaries, that could go on. In other cases, I think things could be potentially more hostile. I think that certainly the prospect for scouting activities from the middle of the 13th century onward would be possible. Um, I think of the work um, on the windway ceremony and references to Aztec room, like looking at that basketry and the and the, uh, the, the moxin and the, the quill work and, and, and other things there. I mean, there's been doubt that Apachean ancestors could have witnessed Aztec ruin in that time frame. I, I don't see a reason to doubt that, look, looking at that material culture now. Whether it's a sustained presence or not, I don't know, but the time frame I think sh surely has to be moved backwards. Um, I think a couple of centuries uh, over what had typically been thought say 20 years ago, Right, right. Yeah. And uh, I know that as a tree ring scientist myself as well, that the, the, uh, the earliest tree ring date is in the, I believe the 1500s that was associated with yeah. Yeah. Or, uh, ancestral uh, Navajo settlement. But um, of course, uh, that there's a lot of assumptions in there. And then the, the material culture, you know, you have to constantly reframe what you're thinking based on the, the evidence at hand. So I think you're, you're it sounds like you're making really uh, great conclusions there. Um, yeah, well, let's see here. So I think we're just about out of questions. Let me just make sure I didn't skip any. Like I said some got pushed into the chat. Um, well, so then I guess one of the, the final question, somebody asked, you know, what is uh, the future of this, this book you're talking about uh, with, with Joel Janeski? When is that supposed to come out? We understand in the fall. Uh, we had hope for the spring, uh, 
Um, uh, but apparently it's going to take that much longer. It's kind of agonizing because, you know, we've been with it for a couple of three years since the SAA symposium that, that we had for it. But it is coming. Um, it's being handed off to the typesetter. I think, again, we're, we're through the page proof stage and they're making the index right now, I think. Uh, so hopefully, as the U Utah Press catalog says, it will be available in, in the fall, uh, a couple of months. Um, we're, we're, all dying, we're all dying to see it. And in some respects, it'll, we get asked a lot of questions about it. And of course, they don't want you circulating it. <laughs> uh, um, some of them, hopefully, will be answered in, in the book. Uh, well, beyond, beyond that, the thing that you brought up, I mean, I do have some remaining grant money I would like in the future to create circumstances where sewing and other experts could come together and, and work with our colleagues at the Natural History Museum of Utah and maybe other places, the Canadian Museum of History where Gabe Yannicki is a curator now and um, have the opportunity to see and think about these things and see how they might be used and valued in, in their, own, their own contexts. And we would like to go back, and this has been influenced by George and Kumaro's health, um, the landowners. We would like to go back and do some testing in what we call the saddle up above the caves. And, and people were obviously very successful at hunting. Uh, we, we think there are some real ambush type strategies and maybe even, um, there may even be a hunting blind that's prehistoric up there. We'd like to go back and do some testing there. I am terrified to go into the caves because Joel and I have our retirement years ahead of us to Joel's determined as he correctly should be that we will also write a monograph about this to leave um, uh, that type of, of, of record of it. So uh, as much as I'd, die, I'd love to go back in the caves, well, here's how Joel put it to me. He said, you know, Jack, when we were starting out on this, he said, excavating a dry cave can end your career. <laughs> and I fully get that now. We went with the intention of recovering very little trying to do some dating and whatnot. And we now have a room full of things that, that need to be finished up in terms of the reporting and, and turned over. We want to unify the collections with stewards and, and they will be, they are actually now, they're actually in Salt Lake City now where they're being sessioned by the Natural History uh, Museum there, um, Glenna Nelson Grimm and, uh, and people they're working on that. So. Great, well, well, we look forward to to, to seeing the book, to hearing more about, about your work at Promontory. And then um, I would love to talk with you more and I'm sure other folks would about opportunities to, uh, to work with indigenous people and do some revitalization of some of these technologies. So, um, well, thank you so much, Jack, uh, Dr. Ives for, for joining us. That was a really just stellar presentation, such an incredible and important topic. And um, even though you're way up there in the North, it just resonates, of course, so so uh, profoundly with with uh, folks down in the southwest here. So, just thank you so much for joining us. Well, we really welcome the opportunity to interact, especially because of the distance at times. So, uh, gosh, if people have questions or have ideas for further interaction, I, I'm only too happy to hear them. Oh, great! All right. Well, yeah. Well, if we get other questions, we'll uh, we can maybe give them your your email address or or compile some stuff and send them to you. So, we'll be in touch. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.